All right. Um, so I'll give a, a short introduction to our, our visitor today, and then she'll kind of take it away. Um, Sarah Zudi is founding principal of Studio Zudi, a landscape architecture, urban design, and public art practice based in Harlem, New York. She brings years of experience leading complex design processes across the Americas with a design approach that works ex explicitly to illuminate the distinct cultural and ecological qualities of a place. Sarah also serves as assistant professor of practice at, ha at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. She is a recipient of a number of awards, including the Hebert Award for Contribution to the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT, and the Silberberg Memorial Award for Urban Design. She was named the 2014 National Olmsted Scholar by the Landscape Architecture Foundation, a 2016 Artist in Residence at the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation, and in 2018 was named to the National Trust for Histo Historic Preservation's inaugural 40 Under 40 list. Most recently, she was named a 2020 United States Artist Fellow. Her work has been exhibited at the 2016 and 2018 Venice Biennales and in the Brazilian and U.S. National Pavilions. She holds a Master of Landscape Architecture from the GSD, a Master's of City Planning from MIT, and a BA in Sociology and Statistics from Boston University. And I know we have a number of people from our, our landscape department who are here. Um, so we're, I'll say for, from both departments, we're really excited to welcome you and, and hear a little bit more about your work. So thank you for joining us, Sarah. Thank you for the introduction, for the invitation. Um, you know, I lament the fact that we're not able to do this in person and um, you know, it would, be, it would be a wonderful opportunity to have gotten to know you all uh, and your community better. Um, but I, I appreciate the opportunity that I have to, to share some of what I've been up to. Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I grew up in Louisiana and um, my sort of intellectual, I would say, journey towards what I do now really um, started in some ways on August 29, 2005, when I watched this uh, storm event brew and barrel towards my, my home state and from, from a college dorm in Boston. And it was really the aftermath of this event that prompted me to you know, really consider what disciplinary realms um, could offer the opportunities and the skill sets to engage in the range of ecological, political, infrastructural, um, you know, factors that would manifest a Hurricane Katrina. And so that somewhat explains the, the range of disciplines I've explored and as, as outlined in my bio. Um, and, but, but I landed at landscape architecture in some ways. Um, I, I think I dabble in, in, in many disciplines, but Landscape architecture has really given me um, a broad set of tools to, to engage in the questions that, um, that started for me in a lot of ways um, in August of 2005. And so my, my practice is really um, is exhibited, I'd say, in a range of different um, formats and medium venues um, from, from practice. We have an office here in Harlem on Lenox Ave when a, Outside opens back up. You all are welcome to come by our studio on um, on Lenox Ave. Um, research, which I, I, depending on how quickly I go through the presentation, I may be able to share some of my current research with you. Teaching, exhibition, curation, writing, all of these activities are not for me parallel activities necessarily. They, they're, you know, I work to make them a, a feedback loop um, such that they compound each other and are really held together by a central set of inquiries. Um, and so a lot of that is, does ultimately get tested and evolved uh, through practice. Um, and so kind of the way that we describe our design methodology in the office is that it's, our work is powered by site interpretation cult and cultural narratives and, um, and a dedication to the craft of construction. What this kind of signals is that you know all of this modes of inquiry and research and interpretation that we engage in on the on the early end on the front end of a project to understand a place and a site are really what influence our design work at every phase of the process. That those emerging narratives 
that we're working through are helping us make decisions about material hierarchies or ex the expression of a material because ultimately it's the built landscape that makes somebody feel like they belong in the world and while that may sound a lofty goal we it is really this de a dedication to this belief that that powers the kind of thoroughness um, of of our work from from start to finish so i mean with this sort of framework and methodology we work at a range of scales and across different geographies um, and so i'll share with you a sampling of some some of our recent projects um, starting with a, a very small uh, streetscape project in Houston, Texas. Um, this is in a neighborhood called Freedman's Town in what, uh, what historically is known as the Fourth Ward. Um, after emancipation, people that were formerly enslaved traveled along the Brazos River, the, from, traveling from the west towards Houston. And they settled a piece of land on Buffalo Bayou that was close to downtown, but at the time was un not settled because it was prone to flooding. It had very clay soils, thick bayou vegetation, all of which they worked to clear. So we're talking about this little plot of land here, and, and this is downtown Houston. Um, and so they constructed their own streets. They built their own sewer system, their own schools. Um, they made their own bricks and paved their own streets, all things that the city of Houston at the time. Uh, would not afford them. And a part of the way that they developed, built this neighborhood was to um, hold some of the lots undeveloped, to hold water, mitigate the flooding, and also layer on the use of fellowship and gathering. So the same lots that were held for stormwater management were also paired with, with praise and worship. And so uh, brush from the bayou were collected and brush arbors were constructed here. Um, and making these, these lots places of gathering. Freedman's Town quickly became the civic heart of Black Houston, home to lawyers and teachers um, and shop owners. The neighborhood since then has fallen victim to what many uh, historically Black communities near the urban core have. Um, we're talking urban renewal. We're talking removal of housing to build public housing, a freeway bisecting the neighborhood. Uh, and among other things, more recently, the intense development pressure given its proximity to downtown. Um, so in 2013, I was working for a small firm that was commissioned uh, by a civil engineering firm uh, to, well, they were subcontracted to a civil engineering firm who was, who was commissioned by the city to redesign Genesee Street, the street that's highlighted here. It's a 60 foot wide away. To the left, you see kind of what the historic grid looked like. To the right, you see the scale of removals that punctuate the neighborhood. Um, those removals were completed in order to build um, two schools. So one of which is a magnet school that serves, that doesn't necessarily serve the historic community. So the, the engineers, you know, working with us landscape architects, you know, pretty much hired us to do what most people imagine landscape architects do, which is, you know, tell them where to put, put the trees and where the curb line is going to go. Um, and, and, you know, they said, well, you know, given the history of this place, you know, maybe you want to put a plaque somewhere or African pavers or, you know, um, statue was also thrown out there. Um, but I, I wanted to take the opportunity to, to dig into this question a little bit further. Um, and so I, I started by looking at the, the history of the architecture itself um, that the settlers built. So on the bottom right, you see the Freedman's Town Shotgun Home, and on the bottom left, or on the top left, rather, the, the Yoruba antecedent. Um, so this architectural type was brought from West Africa to Haiti by enslaved peoples. And then during the Haitian Revolution um, in the late 19th century, um, late 18th century, rather, they brought this architectural type, people that fled from Haiti during this really bloody revolution, brought it to another French colony, which was Louisiana. And um, from there, this architectural type, you know, spread through the bayous of Southeast Texas and landed in Freemanstown. Um, and, you know, what, what makes this architectural type distinct is, among other things, it's the short end of the home facing the streets meant that there were uh, a, a large number of frontages of, of units fronting each block. And so 
there was a sort of density of active of social activation of the streets. Um, and also, you know, the the ubiquity of the porch and these these steps and windows and doors really created the sort of gallery effect um, between the private space of the interiors and the public space of the street that really became kind of this the, the space where everybody's memories are housed when people talk about their complex memories associated with this neighborhood. Many of the most important social interactions happen in this 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 space that's blurred between public and private. Um, so while some of the structures still exist, uh, I you know, documented them at different times and seasons and looking really at the patterns created by these porches and steps and windows and doors. Um, and taking a look at the paving that the original settlers laid, um, the, the pattern along the straightaways of the roads are in this sort of orthogonal pattern, but then at the intersections, you see that they break into this diagonal form and the elders in the community talk about how the original settlers did this to mark the intersection as a space of ritual. And so in our streetscape design, I proposed concentrating the bricks that were salvageable in the intersections to elevate, you know, the, the mark them as a space of ritual. Um, and this school had asked us to construct a site wall here. So instead of a site wall, proposed, um, you know, kind of a, a series of panels uh, made out of concrete with, you know, kind of the modesty of the material and the color meant to speak to the modesty of the original structures, but really abstracting the essential dimensions and rhythms of the shotgun, uh, the, the block of shotgun homes um, that, that activated the, these streets historically. Um, so this is, uh, you know, just modeling that the patterns cast by the natural light and the and artificial light. Um, and you know I proposed using the wood panels from the structures uh, as they get torn down to actually cast the concrete so that the concrete becomes a sort of uh, grain, uh, an imprint of the grain of the original um, structures. And you know, we were meant to also include um, site furnishing seating along this streetscape, and we incorporated that um, that uh, the, the the seating into the walls themselves. Even the planting was really meant to speak to the original um, bayou vegetation that the settlers worked to clear. Um, and then, you know, the school district, when they saw kind of how the concept was coming along, they they offered up a piece of their property that we could make, include into the into the concept design. And so here, where where we couldn't really um, push um, curbless a curbless street profile like like we were wanting to on this public right of way, here on the, in the school district property, we were able to incorporate some of the original ideas about urban stormwater management that the settlers um, implemented here. And so we we proposed holding some of these lots. Uh, creating bias wells and then um, designing an arbor so that people that have been displaced from this neighborhood actually have a place to come back and um, and you know have church functions, markets, um, what have you. Much much as the original settlers devised uh, the sort of double programming of of sites held for water. And so you know, all, all, although this project is a small one in scope and in size. Um, what it speaks to is this idea that the media of landscape architecture being kind of the stuff of everyday life, um, you know, has the potential to tell, st tell stories about places um, just through curbs or planting or street lighting or seating, uh, paving, a site wall. These are all elements that we all work with every day. And what opportunities are there to tell um, stories about these places and their histories, um, just with just with the, with the materials that we work with every day. So scaling up a bit, this is a uh, present uh, a landscape plan that we did for the Fairmount Park Conservancy in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, this is a 22 acre portion of the larger Fairmount Park system in North Philadelphia in uh, Stra the Strawberry Mansion neighborhood. So what you see here is that there's this concentration on the southeast side of the site of amenities. Um, and part of the, the sort of brief before we came into the project was that Reservoir Drive was functioned somewhat as a divider between 
the uh, black residents of Strawberry Mansion who generally use the portion of the park east of Reservoir Drive and um, west of Reservoir Drive, which has kind of more of a regional draw and generally more white um, occupants of this space. And that Reservoir Drive was a divider and the Fairmont Park uh, Conservancy really wanted a master plan for how to, how to think about these divisions and, and implement uh, or you know, guide investment for Mander Park. So um, you know, here are the existing conditions of Mander, of the Mander campus. Um, you know, while the physical conditions of this may not be particularly notable in any way, the significance of this place for people in, in Strawberry, uh, Strawberry Mansion is very significant. Um, people talk about this as being the neighborhood's front yard, a place to get away often from violence, um, from a lot of issues in the neighborhood. This, this, this place represents intergenerational relationships and mentorship, a lot of that through sports programming, after school programming. Um, this, this place offers so much to so many people. And so we saw part of our job as, you know, elevating the physical conditions to match that of the significance um, in people's minds and, ex and lived experiences. Um, part of that was tapping into memory and um, how generational, uh, there's a generational kind of connection to this place. And so we started many of our conversations with folks sharing these archival images, which really opened people up to, to talking about the significance of this place to them and to their lives. One um, community member gave us this poem and she said, it, it says, um, now I have seen monuments, great geometric heaps of stone, lifeless towers raised to keep alive the dead. But I ask, cannot a monument that breathes be built? Um, you know, so this idea of a monument that breathes actually became a conceptual departure for us uh, as we started the project. And we started this project like we do many, which is we do a community engagement event without having really drawn anything. And we come really to just hear how people talk about the space currently. So Knowing that this community has a lot of block parties, we decided to have a block party, an I Love Mander block party. And there was t-shirt making and um, games and we had rappers and MCs and poets come and um, you know, perform about what they love about this place. There were prompts like these for people to talk about what, you know, what is this place today? Um, and it was also a site analysis tool, you know, seeing the site activated and how people use it. At a certain point in the party, we switched out the the, air, the barbecue for aerial maps and we had the 150 participants break into six groups and make collective collages about what they love about this place. And making it a collective collage as opposed to individual um, really meant that people had to engage with each other and kind of debate with each other about uh, the priorities of this place. and. Um, it kind of broke down this sort of binary of the designers and then, you know, talking to the, to the community members. And then each of the six groups then presented to the larger group their collages and gave us a chance to listen to how people articulate what it is that they love about this place. And we analyzed these six collages then, um, not in a sort of one-to-one -one manner, you know, oh, somebody put a picture of bike parking in this corner, therefore they won't bike parking. Um, Rather, we really looked for large strokes for the gestalt that undergirded each collage. And what we found was there were three kind of emerging spatial themes from these, from these collages that we were gonna use to guide our uh, landscape plan. First is activating 33rd Street all the way to the north edge of the park. Second is bringing people into the heart of the campus, you know, bringing them off this, the street edge. And third was creating a, a clear and legible circulation system for people to actually witness and, um, and the range of activities that happen here. And so being able to very clearly demonstrate how those three actually form the structure of our landscape plan became really valuable, a valuable way of communicating our design progress at each step of the way. Um, and so what you see here is we're not, where, where a des the design instinct might be to pull this the center, the social center away from the, the edge, um, given that it is an artifact of the divisions uh, between people here. We wanted to actually honor the fact that that is people's lived experience and not pull away from that, but actually 
um, expand expand on it. And so what we what we're doing with the landscape plan is actually we we doubled the size of the recreation center here, working with Digsaw Architects on that and using that as kind of a launch point, um, both visually and in terms of circulation into the heart of the park, um, proposing a topography that really embraces the, the spectacle of sports and community gathering. Um, and in, even in the topography, what you see here, the way that we've sort of navigated this division uh, across Reservoir Drive is to say, you know, the topography is reflective, again, of the fact that this is the heart of the community. But from a circulation and access and safety perspective, you know, this, this kind of bowl shape and its circulation um, breaks here to connect to Reservoir. And we're offering, you know, mid-block crossings that, that honor um, the fact that safe and accessible crossings are, are, you know, are important here, but at the same time, we're, we're reflecting and working with the way that the space is successful today. Um, we developed a memory plan in where all of the memories that people shared with us um, as being significant to them here, we, we were able to communicate how what we were proposing is actually not only preserving those memories, but working to fortify those into the future, that this plan is not about stamping out those memories, but it's about keeping them and anchoring them. And this is important in the context of a community that's, you know, nervous about the, the potential for displacement. Um, John Coltrane grew up on 33rd Street, that street facing the park. And uh, on the left is this sketch that he did of the mathematics of jazz music. And so we took that sketch and translated that into a paving pattern um, that really laces the, the whole site together and serves as an armature for inscriptions about you know, other notable people in the community, as well as wayfinding um, around the, the park. Um, family reunions are a big uh, activity here. And so we have a whole grove dedicated to that. You might recognize Neek Mill, who's a rapper, who's from this neighborhood in the rendering. And then here in the heart of the park, um, you know, from that Southeast corner, we have a water feature uh, proposed with the words of the poem about the breathing monument inscribed um, so that as you're you know, viewing out into this bowl, into the spectacle of community, that you're reflecting on the words about um, the breathing monument and, and, and taking in uh, the breathing monument that is, is this community. Another project in Philadelphia, on the other side of Philadelphia, on the east side of Delaware River, uh, we are just wrapping up the concept phase on Graffiti Pier. Um, this is a six acre waterfront park. Uh, this is Pier 18 and Pier 20 and inclusive of some of the upland areas here as well. Um, this, we, and we started this project much as we do uh, a lot of our projects, which is with deep research. And our research here revealed to us a, a number of interesting dynamics. One is that, um, in the 1970s, when coal declined in the state of Pennsylvania, that, that trend actually corresponds with another trend, which is the invention of graffiti in Philadelphia. It was invented in Philadelphia, they would love to have you know, it was not invented in New York. Um, and so the coincidence of those two things at the same time brought sites like this one, Graffiti Pier, to, um, to its current use, which is uh, it's defunct from an industry standpoint, but um, significant in terms of um, uh, as a site of, of cultural production. And so until 2010, when Instagram became the huge thing, um, it, it really was just kind of this really un underground landmark. And 2010 meant that it became the most Instagrammed spot in Philadelphia and um, uh, a huge tourist attraction, which means that it became a liability for the railroad company that owned the site because the site is not to code in many ways and not designed for that or staffed or anything. So we were commissioned by the Delaware River Waterfront Corporation who is purchasing the property to consider what the, the future of the site might be. Um, the site is still currently this really beautiful, dynamic street art museum. And you can imagine that graffiti artists having heard the news that there's uh, talks of making this a publicly accessible site, were concerned about the fact that graffiti is a very sensitive ecosystem. Um, it thrives on anonymity. It's about transgression, you know, um, 
And so our pitch in terms of an engagement approach to the client was, was that we would have kind of two, two parallel tracks. One is a public engagement track where we're engaging um, residents and the general public. The other would be um, a discrete series of engagement events um, and tactics to engage graffiti writers because they've been criminalized for their use of the site and the value they've imbued is the beauty that they've that they've imbued on the site, and um, you know they have day jobs and government names and monikers, and so we had a series of uh, off the record conversations with graffiti writers. One of the things that we shared with them early on was uh, the fact that within 30 years the site will be submerged on a daily basis just from high tides, so not even in a storm event necessarily. So the you know graffiti pier is under threat just by virtue of the rising tides. And from the land side, that there is encroaching urban development pressure from the land side. And so the only chance that we have to save Graffiti Pier is actually to take advantage of this opportunity to shape the landscape plan. Because you know, it's not enough to say we're not gonna do anything because it is currently under threat um, from, this, from the sea and from the land. And um, you know, use us as as your instruments to shape a vision for this site. And we started to rebrand the project as a Save Graffiti Pier project. This is an image from one of our meetings in a bar. Um, we we had a bar tab from the client to to meet with graffiti writers and and sometimes their representatives. Um, and so every, in all the conversations, we asked, "What is the best thing that can happen here? What is the worst thing that can happen here?" And then we started to chart all of our responses on this kind of spectrum between new park and untouched. And as you can see, most of the best things that can happen here fall on the side of untouched. And we, we called from here a few emerging themes that we proposed to guide us through the, the landscape plan. One was ensuring the continuation and expansion of art. Two is keeping the site vegetated and passive. Three, making it safe and accessible without looking safe and accessible. And four, keeping it ready. And similar to the Mandra project, being able to then come back and clearly show how these themes that come from those conversations are, are being worked out at the site plan scale um, and being just clear and, and uh, being held accountable to the, the ways, the, the themes that we've heard from them was, is really helpful. Um, so for instance, keeping it gritty, you know, we, when we asked the graffiti writers, what is it, what is grit? Their response was, you know, rocks, mud, water, uh, vegetation, uh, messiness, and so it, it, that ecosystem of graffiti actually intersects with the ecosystem, with the intertidal ecosystem. And so we proposed um, removing the bulkheads and introducing an intertidal landscape here, which you know ecologically is 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 quite significant here in the Delaware River watershed. Um, and offers a way for the site to encroach upland uh, as the tides continue to rise. And also in the high marsh zones offers a way for us to visually buffer um, away from the encroaching development on the adjacent uh, parcels. So that we started to take some early ideas into some renderings and took the renderings back to the graffiti writers. And they, you know, tagged the renderings with their feedback. So then we worked backwards from that decoded their the writing and um, went on to the next level of designing um, and really being able to show how we are lacing these ideas of, of urban stormwater management, upgraded surfacing, seeding um, with the existing characteristics of the site, um, you know, the existing walls that already serve, serve as um, surfaces for art making and, and introducing new ones as well. So for instance, we're introducing um, a more structured green frame, a uh, planted frame around the edge of the pier to again, serve as a visual buffer from this, the development that we can't control. Um, but these ideas also influence the way we're designing site furnishings. So, you know, um, the idea that uh, the furnishings appear as if they were part of the original structure or part of the history of the industrial site, um, also offering surfaces for art making as well. So give you a sense of what this looks like. This is before, this is after, this is a new bioswale introduced, upgraded surfacing. Um, this is before, this is after. So some of the seeding and shade trees and more robust planting. 
Uh, this is before and this is after. We're you know, looking at ways that we can look, work with some of the pioneering species, but really introduce a more robust and sustainable plant palette um, and, and keep the characteristics of the site. This is before, this is atop the trestle um, where people are already climbing up, uh, which is quite dangerous. Um, so what we're proposing here is you know, bringing this, these beautiful railings uh, from the original 1923 construction to code with this netting, um, introducing an ADA accessible ramp here but, and, and using the design of the uh, historic railings. Um, and, you know, for the planting, we got very frequent comments about, you know, don't make this look like the High Line, whatever you do, don't make it look lush. So sedums and grasses, um, again, speaking to the, ex the existing um, character of the site. Um, so this is a, a small project in Seattle, Washington, in a neighborhood called the Central District. Um, the Central District was, in the 1970s, was um, over 70% Black, and today it's about 12%. And so in many ways, you could say that gentrification is complete. Um, but the a, a few people from the neighborhood um, you know, decided to basically ask themselves, like, what is the chapter after gentrification? and they formed a community land trust. They also you know, asked themselves the question, you know, the, the adjacent neighborhood, Chinatown, hadn't seen the same levels of displacement. And they, they, they wondered if the fact that the name of the neighborhood itself spoke to the history of the people there may, um, may be part of it. And so they started to call themselves Africatown and uh, the name is stuck and now policy makers and planning reports, even the mayor um, refers to it as Africatown. Uh, so we were commissioned by the Africatown Community Land Trust to do design ciphers with them. A cipher being, you know, part of hip hop culture um, gave us a different way to design and format a charrette and provided entry points for people um, into, into the, the activity itself. Asking ourselves the question, you know, what is Africatown, what does it look like? Um, and coming up with a plan, a long-term uh, plan for the neighborhood. A couple of projects stemmed from this effort. One was a small public art project. Um, this is a sign that you see all over the neighborhood. Uh, it's very common, this is a private developer. Coming soon, new construction, central Seattle. Uh, you got a jogger, you got a Porsche, you got you know, a dog. These are not scenes in this, you know, this scene is not one that you would associate with the history of the central district. Um, so we decided to make our own coming soon signs. Um, based on the imagery generated from those design ciphers. You know, what would it look like to have Black people in the future of the Central District? What does Africatown look like if you build it? Um, and so we made uh, these fictional, you know, images, um, even these icons at the bottom, you know, roots, landscape, architecture, obelisk, engineering, Africatown developers. Um, these are all fake, icons and companies that would be would need to be potentially homegrown from the neighborhood in order to build Africa Town. Um, and so the fiction kind of continues as you go to the website until you go to the um, events panel and the events panel on these on the website would take you to actual meetings of the Africa Town Community Land Trust. But it was really fun hanging around the signs while they were up. They were up for the summer of 2018, um, you know, people standing around being like, oh my gosh, is this gonna happen, you know? And I, of course, I would just stand there and be like, I, looks like it is, you know? Uh, but it really, what it really did was mobilize people and generate conversation about, okay, wait, how would we make this happen? How can we do this? How can black people be in the central district in a hundred years, you know? So, um, and another project that stemmed from the design ciphers was this activation project. This parking lot as not notable as it seems, is, is in many ways the heart of Black Seattle, um, probably the most important Black cultural landscape among them anyways. Um, people drive from you know, two hours away that have been displaced to hang out in this parking lot. So the African Town Community Land Trust purchased this property and before they had the funding to develop it in the long term, they commissioned us to do kind of a short term activation to really just open people's minds into what might be possible um, with 30,000 square feet, we knew that paint was going to be our best friend. Uh, and so we came up with a graphic with the, at one of the design ciphers, one of the design ciphers was devoted to this question. 
one of the things that came up was the fact that 23rd and Union, this intersection here, is a place where more black men have been incarcerated for possession of marijuana than any other place in the city. And ever since marijuana was legal, made legal in the state of Washington, this building here actually has become a marijuana dispensary. Um, and while, the, while many of those men are still incarcerated. So there was a, a wanting to kind of take that corner back, this corner of 23rd and Union. So, in, we, you know, what we did was we, we designed an outdoor living room to say, you know, what is the most expressive way we can tell people that like, this is yours, you can sit here, you can be comfortable here. Um, and the community members actually wanted to make it out of concrete because in their words, they wanted to concretize their presence in Seattle. Concrete's not a material you necessarily associate with a temporary uh, installation, but we made it happen. Um, so we worked with formerly incarcerated and some homeless uh, people from the neighborhood who had never worked with concrete before to form this concrete. And in fact, uh, they've gone on to work on small landscape installations around the neighborhood with this skill. Um, we also had uh, 300 people from the neighborhood come out and paint. Uh, it was a, a paint the block party. Um, we had music and DJs, lots of cute kids. It is so hard to cut down these images because there's so many of them. Um, I always call this the most beautiful post office parking lot I've ever seen. So this is still a functioning parking lot. Um, we had to integrate what we were doing into, into that. So this is the living room kind of midway through construction. Got some plants in there, softened it up, had the mayor come out and do a red ribbon cutting. So this is the before image, and this is after, after we, you know, installed, or, you know, even the architecture started to look African to us. Um, this is the opening day. We had a reunion on Union, as we called it, and we had um, a huge potluck uh, in the middle of the parking lot. Uh, this is that corner of 23rd and Union before. And this is after. Um, so this really became the community coffee table, as we called it. And residents could submit their favorite images uh, of the, from the history of the neighborhood, and we epoxy those on the top of the coffee table. And it would be would function as a stage and seating, and became really flexible. The site went on to have you know its own series of programming and a life in and of itself. Um, I don't know if I, Jennifer, if I have a few more minutes, I can share one more project or we can open it up for Q&A. Yeah, I think uh, we could share one more. Okay. That's great. Um, I will share a bit of my ongoing research that, in that case. Um, I am researching um, a period in the biography of Frederick Law Olmsted Sr who's considered the founder of the discipline of landscape architecture. Um, in his early 30s, he was commissioned by the New York Daily Times, uh, which is now known as the New York Times, to travel the slave states and write about the conditions of slavery. Um, and how we historicize Olmsted and his biography and, and, and the founding of the profession as a result is that, you know, early in his life, he was a journalist and an abolitionist, and in this, graphic that you see here kind of summarizes that that portion of his life and then we talk about how you know subsequent to that he designed central park um oversaw its construction founded a firm and went on to um, build landscapes across north america until he retired the sort of assertion of my research is that um, it, it's 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 a little bit deceiving to conceive of these as two separate phases of his life, because when we look at the chronology of these activities, they're actually happening alongside each other. And in fact, they were reinforcing of one another that in his personal letters, and he was really going back and forth. And to that, to him, they were part of the same project. Um, and in many ways, he's influenced by, by the historical moments that he was, um, you know, forming himself as, as an adult, and, and which I think is relevant, um, given the times that we live in. And, for students who are thinking today about what does it mean to be educated as a designer um, in the times that, that we're living in now. So uh, in, this, in this timeline, I'll point out um, among other things, the fact that in 1851, January 22nd, um, 1861, just after 
um, the inauguration of Abraham Lincoln and the secession of the South, that Olmsted um, submits his resignation to, to the Central Park Commission and three weeks later begins rewriting his, the articles that he wrote in the New York Times um, in, because he wants to package them into a singular volume called Cotton Kingdom, which is a much more staunchly abolitionist voice. Um, and he feels the need to publish this before the first shots fired of the Civil War that he sees coming. Um, and so, so my work has really been about cotton, the Cotton Kingdom publishing and the writing and then the sort of methodological proposition um, that it represents. Um, and so, you know, there's no debate among historians about the significance of Olmsted's travels. He is the most cited witness of 19th century slavery uh, among historians. And, um, and that is in part because of the breadth and depth of his travels. And so I, I spent four months in 2019 retracing his steps um, to, to take stock of what's happened uh, on those sites and compare them to, to what Olmsted witnessed 165 years ago. This map that you're seeing here is a, is a map that he made with Daniel Goodloe using 1860 census data. And he wanted to challenge the economic argument for slavery, basically uh, spatializing um, the fact that where there are concentrations of enslaved people are the economically poorest portions of the country. Now, of course, there's ex significant concentrations of wealth in the hands of a few, but in terms of the economic health of a region, which he defines in a number of ways, among them soil, civic culture, uh, general wages and condition, labor conditions. Um, he, has a, he has his own sort of definition of the economic health of a region, but um, challenges the, the argument, the economic argument that's broadly made for slavery at the time. Having visited these sites, there are a number of takeaways um, for me that I'm working through now and, and, and writing a, a book about in preparation for the 200th anniversary of Olmsted's birth, which is in 2022. In a lot of these places, the physical conditions of the sites um, have changed significantly, but the social and economic conditions that Olmsted describes are still very present. And um, oftentimes it's actually landscape architecture that has been the tool for revising, recasting, um, erasing, building upon, um, you know, the, the, those physical conditions that, that Olmsted witnessed. And so in sort of an ironic twist of fate that the, 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 the profession that Olmsted advocated for became the tool or in fact the weapon for untelling the stories that he wanted to tell uh, about, about this country. And so it, you know, kind of brings us to today um, and to the fact that we have a really wide range of skills um, inherent to design and what Olmsted, you know, what I would call the methodological proposition inherent in the Cotton Kingdom text is an ability to toggle in between a large scale social economic ecological reading of a, of a place and of the country and then to toggle in back into the site scale and think about the details of light, of topography, of construction, of soil. And that, that sort of, you know, being able to work across the scales and different readings of a place really um, represent, I think, what's possible for design to be, to be relevant and impactful in the times that we live in. So I'll end it there. Thank you so much, Sarah. This is really fantastic. Um, I want to make sure that we have time to open it up to questions. Um, you know, but one of the things that I, th I think is so powerful about your work um, is are the ways in which you're encouraging people to kind of imagine a different future, one where they're in it, they're seen to be in it, they're driving the vision of what that future is. Um, you know, I really appreciated you showing all the different and varied ways in which you've engaged in um, kind of amplifying those, those voices. Um, and that they actually start to become a kind of uh, like literal aesthetic motif in the work, right? That this kind of layering of narrative with super graphics and text and um, a kind of rewriting of the landscape, if, if you will. Um, 
I wanted to see if if others have specific questions. Oh yeah, here we go. Tom Fisher, you're always great for like a opening question. I love it. Um, <laughs> So he asked, soon after Olmsted wrote The Cotton Kingdom, he led the Sanitary Commission during the Civil War in partnership with public health. How do you see those two aspects of Olmsted's interest in social commentary and public health in the 1860s relating to, to landscape architecture today? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, you know, the Sanitary Commission is essentially a precursor to the Red Cross. I mean, it's interesting to think about today, right, where public health, you know, public health is obviously shaping our lives from morning to night in every way possible. And really calling, I mean, it, sh it shaped widely what was possible then for landscape architecture. The fact that you could propose an 840 acre park was only a function of the sort of public health ills of the city. And so it, it begs the question of what, what is the scale of landscape architecture that we can be talking about today? Um, but I think in terms of social commentary, I mean, it, he was essentially like, you know, part fighting in the civil war by virtue of that role. And, and so what I think is under told about his story is how much he felt that civic ground and landscape architecture were part of a post abolition society. They were critical to the idea of us coming together after hundreds of years of enslavement. Um, that was that was the project that came out of his travels in the South. He comes back from the South, works on Central Park, then, you know, moves away from Central Park to his role, you know, in the Sanitary, U.S. You know, Sanitary Commission. These are all part of the same thread, which is, for him, about civicness. This is what he's ultimately concerned with, is civicness. And how do you even create civicness out of this society that's literally in war with itself. Um, to him, it was it was about about ground, about the civic ground, and um, and I think that I think that still holds today. I think that's still a big question for us today. Yeah, I think I mean you eloquently said earlier in your talk that you know the built landscape makes someone feel like they belong in the world, and so when we think about um, the ways in which we live together. Right, that that happens in a place somewhere. Mm. Um, you know, it's. I, I think it's so fascinating because I feel like, I mean, certainly in my studies of uh, architecture, we, you know, probably not as much as landscape architects do, but you know, we talk at, at length about Olmsted, and I feel like this part of his legacy is so overlooked. So, your text is. Um, I'm eagerly awaiting it. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Okay, so more questions here. Community engagement seems to be playing out in such a fun way during your work, and I love that so much. Do you have any ideas, methods on how we could possibly do something similar for academic projects, or how we might practice community engagement like this while we are still students? That's a great question. You know, um, I'm glad that you think it's fun. That's kind of the point. You know, a lot of these, a lot of the communities that we're working in, you know, we're working in in context of a lot of mistrust, warranted mistrust of planners and architects. And um, so part of being creative about the format is to acknowledging that that is the, 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 the environment that we're engaging in. Um, and so we want people to continue living their lives and be foster any kind of joy that we can and really just slip ourselves into the rhythm of of the community and not make it feel like it's a meeting. We, in fact, we don't ever call them meetings. Um, because, and we have certain rules we hold ourselves to. We don't allow ourselves to use um, post-it notes uh, just as a rule, just to hold ourselves to you know some basic things that'll keep us from defaulting. Um, but I think broadly speaking, I, I, I see that the I see the format of engagement itself as a design project. You know, when people ask us like, well, what do you do for engagement? What, what's your uh, toolkit? And the idea is to not have one. The idea is to really um, be open-minded about and, and really the way that you would do site analysis for a design that you do the same for crafting your engagement approach in any particular context. Um, 
And that might help in an academic setting where, you know, they're not actually maybe getting anything per se out of it, um, that you are actually offering an opportunity uh, that may be fun, enjoyable, educational for folks to participate in. There's a, a question about Graffiti Park regarding the cleanup. Um, what was done? Was there any cleanup that was done to remove hazardous materials or waste to make it usable? I mean, I think kind of embedded in that question is is the sort of subtlety of the renderings, right? That like there's a, a kind of you know kind of gentle structuring of what's happening there. But um, yeah, how much was there also this kind of you know attitude about amelioration, cleanup, removing hazardous materials, et cetera? Yes, this is a topic of big debate. I mean, it, um, there are a lot of needles on the site now and cleaning that up is first order of, of work. Um, but, and then removing major obstacles to circulation that present hazards to safety. I mean, that's the whole idea of making it safe and accessible without looking safe and accessible is we are making it safe. Um, and there is some upgrading of surfacing, but it is, it is strategic and tactical because uh, people don't people want it to be safe, but they don't want it to look safe. And um, so, I mean, to answer the question bluntly, yes, there's cleanup that's being done now and planned into the future. Um, but there is a certain aesthetic that and and restraint that we're holding ourselves to, asking ourselves at each step of the way, you know, do we cross the line? Are we not? Are we not close to the line enough? It's a constant negotiation with ourselves, with the artists, with other users of the site, um, which makes for an interesting project. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to hear more about all of the kind of. I feel like that's a very delicate dance, right? Like <laughs> you have so many competing audiences. Uh, particularly in, in a place like that. Um, but maybe that's off <laughs> that's for a later conversation. If you were here in person, we could talk about that. Right, right. <laughs> the reception or something like that. Um, so Gabriel asks, thank, or he says, thank you for this incredible talk and sharing your inspiring work. Academic and professional structures tend to separate what is considered landscape mm -hmm. architecture, architecture, planning, etc. Yet your work moves across these fields. How would you encourage students to see their agency in this broad way, rather than confining their creativity and ethical perspectives to a specific discipline? That's a beautiful question. You know, um, I would say don't do what I did, which is like do a bunch of degrees. Um, instead, I would. <laughs> I think, I mean, what even maybe opened my eyes to wanting to try different disciplines um, is, is something that I think anyone can do in their educational intellectual journey, which is to read outside of your discipline, to reference work outside of your discipline and, and, and feel like, I, I think for me, I had to do that because I wasn't finding anything relevant in landscape architecture. Um, and so I found myself, myself you know, actually reading a lot of architectural discourse, I found myself looking at precedents and reading even cultural studies and philosophers and so forth. And, um, and, plan, and planning has a lot to say about engagement. Not all of it is good, um, but it, they have a discourse. Landscape architecture doesn't really have much of one. And so make yourself comfortable and confident in you know, walking into those conversations, taking those classes, reading those books and looking at those websites and projects. Um, and feel like it's relevant, make it make it relevant, even if, you know, classes don't present it that way or whatever, um, that you have to piece together your own view and your own, own, own practice and design and, and find inspiration where you can. Yeah, I think that's really beautifully put and, um, you know, I love how you talked about the kind of, and I think it's it's evident in, in the work too, from the kind of, you know, the sort of uh, the careful restraint that you described in the Graffiti Peer Project, um, or just the kind of deliberateness of your process that you really are crafting a practice, right? That, that you're being very kind of, you know, it's incredibly thoughtful about what you bring into your awareness and how you're either you know amplifying other people's voices or encouraging you know a 
uh, regulatory body to like view this project in a different way, right? Like, and that takes a certain amount of, of bravery, courage, determination, et cetera. Um, so I just, yeah, I feel like it, that should also be said that that's a lot of, uh, a lot of care and kind of intellectual labor and emotional labor and work to do that, to bring that into the process and to, to, uh, craft a, pra a practice so thoughtfully. So, um, you know, you present it with ease and <laughs> with a certain amount of, of grace, but I think it's really important, certainly for students to understand that, right? That it's coming from this place of, this position of deliberateness in your process. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I really loved how you talked about kind of crafting the practice. Um, so many uh, notes of thank you here. <laughs> um, uh, another question, um, I so appreciate you from Karen Lutsky, uh, who teaches in our, uh, our landscape uh, architecture department here. I so appreciate your sharing of your work today. So thank you. Might you be willing to expand on the role of vegetal growth in the covering up of historical landscapes and discuss how you use vegetation and growth in your designs? That's a great question. And it's actually something I should say that we are positioning ourselves really to explore now, especially as the graffiti, like I said, the Graffiti Peer Project is just wrapping up concept phase. So when we move on to the subsequent phases, we'll be able to explore this more. But philosophically speaking, we really want to, I mean, one of, I didn't present this project, um, but this is kind of what started this inquiry for me. It's, it was a project in Brazil um, for, that was a memorial for, um, to the history of slavery in, in Rio de Janeiro. And in the project, um, we found that uh, enslaved Africans were bringing um, a lot of seeds with them to the Americas that uh, because of the history of continental drift, actually the soil profile of Brazil and that of Southwest Africa are actually similar. They used to touch 300 million years ago. And so when those plants were brought to the Americas, they hybridized and flourished in the new world. And we wanted to use those plants in the design and the city of Rio said, you know, these plants aren't native, you can't use them. And um, our response was to say, you know, the idea of native plants um, is basically based on which plants were present when Europeans were here and is ignores the sort of constant migration of plants and humans. And when we made that argument, we showed, showed them some drawings of this, um, they actually relaxed that policy for us. In order to engage in that, we had to really look species by species about what, what habits of the plant are actually detrimental, like as opposed to just throwing it out because it's invasive. What, how does it actually function here? In what ways is it detrimental or not? What is the cultural value of it? How do we weight that? Um, and so that, that project kind of brought me to the place I am now about planting and vegetation, which is, you know, a balanced, trying to keep a balanced look about the value of each species. And that includes pioneering species that we might call weeds. Um, and, you know, this is vegetation that people love at Graffiti Pier right now. Now making that robust and sustainable um, is also part of what needs to be weighted. But um, this, these are really what I'm sharing with you are, are inquiries that we will be working through as we move forward in Graffiti Pier and other projects. Um, but this is an interest of mine that I really want to, to push and explore in, in the future projects. Um, it's so interesting, the kind of unpacking of what we even considered to be these like very foundational terms, right? I mean, um, I think certainly like in kind of, you know, architectural representation, talking about perspective and how that, you know, privilege, privileges a sort of notion of ideal man and um, kind of unpacking like some of the very foundational, um, you know, things that we maybe don't, yeah, we just take them for granted and we don't think critically about them. So I love the kind of unpacking of what actually a native plant means and it speaks to, your sort of continual unpacking of like the deep histories of, of the land, right? That like, mm -hmm. okay, actually these continents touched at one point. And so <laughs> like, if we look at, you know, this on a much broader time scale, um, 
you know, what does native really mean? I, I, I really appreciate that. Um, we're sort of nearing the end of our time here. I wanted to make sure if anyone had any questions that they just wanted to like shout out, we don't have to, you don't have to type all of them in the chat. I know that takes a little bit of extra effort. Um, so if anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask a question or otherwise. Or even if you want to share your faces, I feel like I'm looking at oh, a, yeah. lot, oh, gosh. a lot of like anyone? names, but I oh. don't see names so much. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I have a question about um, civic space. So mm -hmm. having worked in Brazil, I I'm sure civic space is very different there than it is in a lot of our cities here, where often you, you go to a location which is uh, designed for a certain meaning or message. Uh, yeah, can you speak a little bit more about that and the challenges of civic space here in America? Well, I'm, I, I want to hear a little bit more about um, the heart of your question in comparison to Brazil. What, it, what are you referencing? Uh, it's, it seems like, oh, at least in our city, in, in Minneapolis, um, we, we have memorials, we have specific locations which uh, are, are crafted to, to bring people together. Mm -hmm. And it's very discreet mm. rather than a continuous thing in, and maybe maybe I'm just speaking about our, our city here in particular, okay. but I, I think it has to do with ownership and property and Um, well, I, I mean, I, maybe I can speak to memorials. Maybe is that the heart of your question about the discreteness of memorials? Sure. Um, uh, so, you know, I actually don't know Minneapolis that well. Obviously, it's been in the news a lot recently. And um, I, I spent half my childhood in the same city that, or in the city that George Floyd is from in Houston. So I can relate to, to his story in that way. I, I spent six hours, I think, in Minneapolis. Um, I got a quick driving tour. So I don't actually know what you're referencing specifically, but um, I will speak, I can speak to memorials and civic space broadly and my thoughts on that. Um, you know, I, the idea of a memorial as we think of it in, in architecture and landscape architecture is um, rooted in the history of monumentality in, in you know, classical antiqu antiquity. And it has a very specific relationship to everyday space, which is that it is distinct, it is considered distinct from everyday space that um, memorials have a very, um, you know, they're, they're, they're based on the idea of an event, um, a person, a tragedy, a triumph. It's a sort of like object oriented artifact uh, of, of a discrete moment in time. But the way that we are pushing this idea of a memorial in Rio was that if you know if we're talking about memory of events uh, uh, that were not you know single day events or you know slavery for instance was 400 years of the way the world operated and its effects are still present today so that would suggest a different approach to designing for memory and narrative in civic space that's different from an object on a pedestal a statue uh, a, a, you know a wall with names on it um, that the actual use of public space people the rituals that people um, engage in in public space are the memories of of these different um, dimensions of time and so um, how do we actually design public space to be supportive of those rituals as opposed to telling singular narratives of a person or a date in time um, I think is the is the is a kind of shift that in our practice we're working towards when we when we talk about memorials and memory and civic space that we're really trying to talk about actually public space the health and success of public space itself as opposed to objects on pedestals i hope that speaks to your interest because it's trying to weave through your yeah yeah thank you okay. yeah, and it ma makes me think about time the way that time is almost compressed now where we can search for things and it's mm. it's not dependent on events yeah, and, and the idea, I mean, this is a little bit more like cosmological, but one of the things that we were thinking about too is the fact that, you know, it is a very Western 
definition of time to be linear and to think about the past as a thing that's in the past. And in a lot of more Eastern philosophies of time, that time is circular. And so if the past is not in the past, what does that mean for designing a memorial? It means that what you're designing for into the future is about the past. And um, it's a more dynamic approach to designing civic space. I really, um... I mean, obviously you don't know this, but I think you, 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 the last comment looped really um, beautifully into uh, some of the discussions that we had uh, after Jerome Hayford's lecture, where he was also talking about this idea of a kind of living memorial or thinking about, um, you know, the sort of multiple narratives of the territory in a way that isn't about this sort of, yeah, like a kind of, uh, progress-based march, right? <laughs> of like, like then this happened and then this happened and then this happened. So there's mm. a kind of like legible unfolding of events, but um, thinking about things in a little bit more of a layered way. Mm. Um, I'm really, oh, let's see if there's, okay, this is gonna be our last question, Luke. Um, thank you so much for sharing. Many of the projects are large scale public projects where you can tackle these issues. What are opportunities do you think exist for landscape architecture firms doing work in private residential landscape design with traditionally very wealthy clients to support equity and social justice. Yeah. Okay, question. Um, you know, it, it's interesting because actually doing residential landscape design is a huge interest of mine, but I think, I think people think that if you do one type of work, you wouldn't be interested in the other. And because I, I feel like there's a lot to explore in terms of material and detail and just, you just become more facile in design working at a residential scale. Um, but to answer your question, you know, one firm that I've been following and that I have a relationship with who's been doing some interesting work in this regard, they do pretty much exclusively residential landscape design is Terramoto. And they've introduced um, a kind of a social justice tax to their clients. Um, I think it's 3% of the budget is, is additional. Yeah, it's beautiful work. Um, 3% of is taxed to, to the client. Um, and then that's also matched by the firm. And so they have this growing fund that they've been actually using. I mean, this just started actually in June. Um, and this fund they're still kind of devising what they're going to do with it. They have some really interesting ideas. I don't think they've implemented any of them yet, other than some scholarships, I think. Um, but that's one example that I've heard that I thought was interesting. Um, I think it's worth brainstorming further and thinking just generally about, okay, we have this industry, we have clients and relationships and this work that we're doing, how do we train people? I mean, even this project, this Africa Town project, having a few folks learn how to form the concrete ended up sending them off to have different professional trajectories. So I think they're really, when you're working at a small scale, they're really interesting ways to kind of loop people into the process as well. Um, but it's an interesting question that I'm gonna keep um, thinking about myself. Yeah, I think that's a provocative one that landscape architects, architects, everyone uh, in you know built environment professions needs to think about. Um, because people are practicing in so many different ways, but the work needs to happen in so many different ways. Um, the, the, the kind of focus on equity and social justice. Um, so I just wanted to echo the many comments in the chat saying, fantastic, thank you, thoughtful, congrats, wonderful, thank you. <laughs> um, and just say that we're so, uh, we feel so fortunate to have learned from you today and gotten to know you a little bit better and we'll have to have you back at some point uh, not only to kind of uh, tour our city here but also you know do all the appropriate whining and dining and <laughs> those sorts of good things um, but thank you so much for, you. for being here thank you for the invitation it's lovely to meet you guys and see some faces and the best all right cheers thank you Thanks. Great question, Ben. <laughs>
want to stop recording? Yeah. Oh, how do I do this?